We've all seen the pictures and read the stories in the history books about the kings and queens with their power and privilege and silks and furs. But in this series, I want to discover the other side of history. I'm already quite nervous. The side we don't often hear about. How ordinary British people lived their lives. From the Tudors, you'll see why it did attract my attention. <laughs> Disgusting. To the Victorians. Throw a stone in Victorian London, you will hit a drunken cabman. There's, there's, there's that many of them. We are not amused. From the Georgians. You take the saw. Oh, my God. It's you horrible don't. just seeing you do that. Oh. To the people who really fought the Second World War. James could hear the ping of bullets and the clatter of shrapnel. One thing's for sure, these people knew the meaning of the word tough. I'll be finding the truth about their daily lives. What they ate, how long would that have lasted? Up to three years. How they made a living. There's even value in a rat when it's dead. And those vital necessities of life. What did you do if you wanted to pee? Guy in the bucket. The bucket? This is British history from the bottom up. You've got to admit, I am terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> this time, I'm heading back to the Victorian age. When Britain ruled the world. And mutton chops weren't just something you ate, they were also... Lovely whiskers. Why, thank you. Now, while you might be thinking the Victorian Britain was made by a bunch of mustachioed men like him, the truth was very different. Because the unsung heroes who really put the great into Great Britain were just the ordinary folk who had to cope with the most dramatic changes the world has ever seen. While Queen Victoria was busy gazing down from her throne, her loyal subjects were hard at work in factories up and down the land, churning out everything from steam engines to natty clothes and cutlery. But life on the factory floor was cheap. A combination of lethal machinery and long hours meant that gruesome accidents, even death, were never very far away. And right up there in the list of most lethal jobs in Victorian Britain was the match girl. Like Sarah Chapman here, still called a girl when this picture was taken when she was almost 30. In the late 1800s, if you went down the Mile End Road, turned left at a pub called The Swan and down a little alleyway, you'd come to Sarah Chapman's house. She lived in a court just like this one, in a house with her father Samuel, her mother Sarah Ann and her six brothers and sisters. One of seven kids, Sarah was a feisty young un with a sharp brain. We know that at school she learned how to read and write. But this, remember, was Victorian Britain, where at the age of 13, working-class kids like Sarah had to put aside such fripperies as education and get themselves a job. And for Sarah, that meant starting work in the same factory as her mum and sister. This is where Sarah worked, the Bryant and May Match Factory. Back in those days, it would have been frenetic around here, with over a 1,000 women and girls working here six days a week, every week. You see, there was nothing the Victorians loved more than setting fire to things. Lamps, logs, more lamps, and, of course, tobacco, which meant that the humble match was an invaluable item. This is an old Bryant and May matchbox. And the thing about this match was that it would strike anywhere, as you can see. Yeah, very effective. So effective that by 1860, Bryant and May were churning out 75,000 boxes of the things every day. To keep up with demand, match girls like Sarah were expected to work 14-hour shifts, virtually all of it on their feet. Can you imagine? 
Luckily, she was promoted, and by 19, Sarah was working as a machinist, the person who cut the matchsticks down to size. If Sarah ever got sick, that was just tough luck. The factory was perfectly entitled to discard her like a, well, like a spent match. <laughs> For all that, she earned a meagre wage of five shillings a week, which is about 16 pounds a week in today's money. But even that could be severely reduced by harsh fines on things like sitting down, being untidy, dropping a match, or even just going to the toilet without permission. Nor was there much let up when Sarah finally got home. Sam Johnson is Sarah's great great granddaughter, and she's here to tell me a bit more about her home life. There were seven children in the family. Which is why there's so many beds here. Exactly, yes, yes, and they would have all been cramped into, into a tiny room like this. So maybe that's what created her feisty personality. I bet she was the boss in the bedroom when she was a kid. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Chuck the boys on the floor and uh, get a good get sleep. Beds, yeah. <laughs> As for her one day off, well, after a quick breakfast of bread and dripping, it would be out with the broom and on with the housework. <coughs> the girls, as soon as they were old enough, would have pulled their weight with the housework. So they would do all the washing of the clothes and the cleaning the house and getting the baking done ready for the week. Only then would Sarah finally have been able to put her feet up with a nice cup of tea and perhaps a puff on a pipe. The next morning... <laughs> and it would be up with the lark for the start of another shift at the factory. But Sarah's life wasn't just exhausting. It was also blooming dangerous. <laughs> you see, unlike today's safety matches, matchsticks back then were dipped in a chemical called white phosphorus. It was this that made the matches catch fire. But phosphorus comes with some horrible side effects. And there was one that Sarah dreaded above all others. Girls who'd worked here for some time could get a condition which they called fuzzy jaw. It was a terrible disease that caused the bones around the mouth to slowly rot away and emit a foul-smelling pus. As the infection spread, it would lead to horrendous disfigurement, organ failure and eventually death. Luckily, Sarah escaped this grisly fate, but many of her co-workers, around one in ten of them, didn't. Not that the factory owners seemed to care. <laughs> Even Sarah's lunch hour was full of danger. The women and girls were forced to eat their lunch on the factory floor where phosphorus particles could easily get into their food. There was no other space available and they weren't allowed to eat outside. Health and safety. <laughs> so bad were conditions in the Bryant and May factory that on the 6th of July, 1888, Sarah and her fellow workers downed matchsticks and went on strike. By the end of July, Bryant and May had caved in. The whole thing had been a complete PR disaster for them, and they agreed all the women's demands. You can imagine Sarah and her friends racing out of here absolutely over the moon. On the back of the hard graft of ordinary Victorians, the UK became the richest and most powerful nation on Earth. With all that money rolling in, the Victorians did what great empires have always done. They built things. Huge engineering projects like railways, bridges and tunnels. Many of them still in use today. Building these monster projects was the job of the navvies. Big strapping blokes like Angus Innes from Glasgow. Now, we don't exactly know what Angus looked like, but we can take a guess. Because Scottish navvies like nothing more than dressing up in their spare time, just like teddy boys, mods and Peaky Blinders, 
to let people know who they were. They sported moleskin jackets, scarlet waistcoats and bright blue caps. This is the kind of place where Angus would have lived. He would have rented a room or part of a room or even part of a bed in a boarding house. It would all have been pretty grim. Most of Angus's time, though, was spent building things, like Glasgow's new sewage system. You see, Victorian Glasgow was dirtier than a badger's bottom. Its slums were so bad, they were almost as disgusting as London's. Coming home at night from the pub, Angus would have constantly had to watch his step for fear of treading in something unmentionable. In this kind of environment, disease was rife. A system of tunnels was needed to get all the sewage out of the city. And it was navvies like Angus who were called on to do the work. After a typical navvies breakfast of six slices of bacon, a loaf of bread, one can of condensed milk and two pints of beer, Angus's 12-hour shift would begin the moment his foreman gave the order. His job was to dig the huge trenches that held the new sewage pipes. Using muscle power alone, Angus was expected to shift a hernia-inducing 20 tonnes of earth a day. The more muck he moved, the more he was paid. On average, that was about 25 pence a day, the equivalent of about eight quid. But most of that he would have spent on beer. A mind-boggling gallon a day of the stuff. Oh, cheers. This massive sewage pipe is an impressive example of the kind of work that navvies were doing here in Glasgow in the 19th century. But to get a more vivid picture of Angus's life, I'm going to travel 30 miles north of here into the Highlands. From census records, we know that by the late 1850s, Angus had up sticks and moved here to the bonny banks of Loch Katrine, where he was helping to build a tunnel to carry clean drinking water into Glasgow. This is the water tunnel, which ran for 30 miles straight into the centre of Glasgow. The census also tells us that Angus was now married and that his wife Helen and their young family were living here too. No doubt enjoying the peaceful countryside, along with hundreds of other navvies and a bunch of angry locals. Midges. By now, Angus was moving up in the world and had swapped his shovel for a much more important job. Using explosives to blast a tunnel through the mountains which was, of course, very, very dangerous. In fact, the accident and death rate for navvies was higher than for any other group of workers in the country, and that included coal miners and soldiers. No wonder Angus liked a tipple. At the end of the day, exhausted from blowing up the Scottish countryside, Angus would have rejoined Helen and the kids at the temporary camp beside the loch. Here to tell me more about life inside the camp is local historian Sean Barrington. It was a well-organised community. There'd be the cooking squad, so there'd be no problem getting beef and lamb and pigs and oatmeal porridge. There'd be porridge morning, noon and night. That's astonishing. I, I would have assumed that a navvy working here would have been three-quarters starved and having the most miserable time possible. But actually, what you're describing is something that, yeah, it's rigorous, Yes. but uh, at least your belly's full. Were the women able to work? Oh, the women would be fully, fully employed. There would be laundry that would need to be done. So, lots of meat by day, booze by night, and clean pants. And, absolutely. <laughs> After four years of muck, sweat and beer, Angus's time at Loch Katrine finally came to an end. And in 1859, the new water channel he'd helped to build was opened by none other than Queen Victoria. I name this pipeline the Katrine Aqueduct. Navvies like Angus were a special breed. 
They were itinerant, rootless, often very isolated. It was like you had the working class there and somewhere down here were the navvies at the very bottom of the pecking order. And yet it was people like Angus and his like who built modern Britain with their bare hands and their legacy is still with us today. The Industrial Revolution really took off under the Victorians. But none of their fancy steam engines, cotton mills or water pumps would have been any use without coal. Coal powered the Victorian age and the mining industry was huge. In 1841, nearly 220,000 people worked in the mines most of them were men, but around about 5,000 of them were either women or children as young as five. Among these women was one Betty Harris. We don't have any actual photos of her, but she might have looked a bit like this young lass, holding what seems to be a giant tambourine. Betty and her husband lived in a small rented cottage not far from Knowles Pit in Bolton. A place much like this. It was all very cosy. Fire was going all the time, of course. Well, fuel was everywhere, wasn't it? And here's a clue. Tiny little seat, tiny little potty. They had two children, and when they were at work, Betty's cousin looked after them. In order to keep Betty's household going, her cousin did all the housework. She cleaned the house, she went shopping every day, because fridges hadn't been invented yet. She cleaned the courtyard, she did all the washing. Imagine how difficult it would have been keeping things clean with all that smoke and dust about. I oh, don't envy her. But if running a Victorian household wasn't exactly a barrel of laughs, working down the mine was just horrendous. Six days a week, dressed in trousers and jacket, our Betty would leave the house at dawn and head down pit, where she could spend the next 14 hours on her hands and knees like a beast of burden hauling coal. It's hard to imagine anything more grim. To learn more about Betty's life underground, I've come to Cap House Colliery near Wakefield. If you'd like to follow me, please, through all these doors. Yep. I've been joined by Denise Bates, whose great-great-great-great-grandmother was a Victorian mining lass like Betty. But can you imagine just schlepping up and down here every single day? I think we sometimes don't realise we're bored. <laughs> no, we don't do it. Just like Betty, we're going to have to crawl on our hands and knees to get to the coal face. Whoa! Oh, God! It <laughs> really hurts your hands. Like most of the women and children who worked in the mines, Betty's job was to drag the big, heavy carts used to carry the coal. So this is the conditions that Betty would have been working in, right? Oh, definitely. She reported that she was working in a very nasty pit. Oh! I can't imagine what it must have been like if these were your working conditions for how many hours a day, do you reckon? 14 hours, depending on demand. Blimey. And would you get up to the surface at lunchtime? Not a chance. <laughs> More likely to have been a hunk of bread and cheese on the go. Is this the cold face here? Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, yeah. I should have touched that. <laughs> So, uh, tell me about Betty. She was working for her husband, which was the practice of females who mined in Lancashire. What do you think their relationship would have been like? Betty mentions that there's an awful lot of domestic violence going on, that there were very many women who were being beaten by the man that they worked for, for no other reason than their inability to move those trucks as fast as the men wanted. What with the heat, the dust and the regular beatings, Life for Betty was about as tough as it gets. When Betty got home from work, usually around 6.30 or 7 in the evening, she would have been 
absolutely exhausted. She'd have been filthy, sweating, but she would have been far too tired to have a wash before she went to bed. One thing she'd definitely have done, though, is have a decent meal. She'd have needed the calories. Apart from rent, virtually all her money went on food. Victorian delicacies such as tripe, trotters, or budget lamb cuts from sheep that had dropped down dead from disease. Come Sunday, her one and only day off, Betty was then expected to catch up on chores like darning socks and knitting stockings, while hubby put his feet up and contemplated the serious issues of the world. But Betty's life was about to change. In 1838, a flood at a Yorkshire colliery drowned 26 children, prompting a report after a lengthy public inquiry. So the report was published, and as you can imagine, the press were all over it. Here's some of the daily newspapers that came out in May 1842. Some great pictures here. Look, you've got propelling the loaded wagons, digging out the coal. Imagine seeing these for the first time if you didn't know that that kind of thing went on in your country. But the revelations didn't end there. In fact, it wasn't the long hours, the dust, the awful conditions, the industrial accidents that shocked people. It was, believe it or not, the nudity. The girls, they are naked down to the waist. Young females dressed like boys in trousers crawling on all fours. Any sight more disgustingly indecent or revolting can scarcely be imagined than these girls at work. No brothel can beat it. Disgusting. In actual fact, if it hadn't at all, such topless working was extremely rare. But still, the report had a dramatic effect. And in 1842, the Mines and Collieries Act put a stop to women, including our Betty, working underground. In Victorian Britain, the place to be was in the city. London might have been filthy and plagued by crime, but by the 1850s, it was the world's largest city. And in just 40 years, its population doubled in size, just like Queen Victoria's waistline. We are not amused. And all those new people meant lots of work for London's cabbies. Keb, sir, keb. Men like John Cochrane. John was born in 1833 and lived in Hoburn, an old-fashioned part of London full of narrow alleyways and densely packed housing but he was looking to move up in the world. The year is 1851, and 18-year-old John Cockrum wants to set up in business. He wants to do exactly what his dad did before him and be the driver of a horse and cab. Hello, Daniel. You are looking so beautiful, aren't you? <laughs> but sadly, his dad isn't around anymore to show him the ropes. Because when John was 11, his old man had passed away. Leaving behind a wife, four kids and a huge pile of debt. To make ends meet, the young John had been forced to become the main breadwinner. And by 18, he scrimped and saved enough money to buy himself a horse, hire a cab, and follow in his dearly departed dad's footsteps. But the problem for John was that he looked really young. And on one of his first journeys, he was accused of being a buck, which was the slang word for an unlicensed driver. But he wasn't. He was perfectly legal. He was over 16, and he knew the highways and byways of London, which were the two stipulations. Right, let's go. Come on. <laughs> Back in the 1850s, London streets would have been filled with horse-drawn cabs just like this. 
leaving great piles of steaming dung in their wake. But while the middle-class passengers were able to put their feet up and enjoy the view, for working-class lads like young John, the job was relentless, six days a week. On an average day, he'd start touting for work about 9am and finish at midnight. He didn't have a little yellow for hire sire on the top of the cab. If he wanted to show people that he was available, he held up his whip like this. Where to, love? Sitting on top of his cab, with only a hat and a couple of old coats for protection, John was exposed to the very worst of London's weather. Chucking all that Victorian soot and smog and the lifestyle of cabbies like John was about as healthy as smoking 40 a day. <laughs> the money wasn't much better either. To make a profit, he had to work really hard. You only got sixpence a mile for a cab like this, and out of that, you had to pay yard money for the stabling and feeding of the horse. It's a tough old job. And it was about to get a whole lot tougher. You see, horses can be very temperamental. As poor old John discovered one afternoon, shortly after buying his very own cab, when his horse suddenly bolted, causing his new set of wheels to flip over, leaving John with a hefty repair bill. Mm. In fact, accidents like this were pretty common, and more often than not, they were caused by the same thing. Cab drivers were notorious for spending hour after hour in the pub. But did they really? I'll ask a cabbie. Taxi driver Sean Farrell writes a blog on the history of London's cabbies. So, by law, they should have been sitting on the box of the cab, no matter what the weather. Yeah. In truth, they hid inside a pub. Presumably, there must have been examples of cab drivers coming out of the pub hammered and having accidents. Oh, they're, they're numerous. It, <laughs> throw a stone in Victorian London, you will hit a drunken cab man. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's that, there's that many of them. But not John Cockrum. Because John, one of the few cabbies who refused to work on a Sunday, didn't approve of the demon drink. So while his fellow cabbies were off getting plastered, John could be found sitting on the taxi rank, reading a book, and munching on a popular Victorian dish, sorted herring. And before long, he'd signed up to an extraordinary new idea. A scheme to stop cabbies from drinking and driving. I know, mad. I'm not really allowed in here, am I? I'm not a cabbie. You're not, but I'll let you, I might give you my badge. <laughs> in 1875, John attended the opening of London's very first cab shelter a place where cabbies could wait for customers without drinking their body weight in beer. It's great in here, isn't it? Lovely. It's nice and compact and bijou. Yeah. It's a funny shape, though, isn't it? It's really long and thin. They're designed to be the same width and length as the original horse and car coach, so they didn't take up no more extra space in the road. Oh, so, so just go cab, 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 little hut, cab, cab. Exactly. Do you think it would have been very similar in Victorian times? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they've got electric lighting there. It would have been gas lighting in them days. But they've got, they got a gas stove. They would cook, provide hot meals for you, hot tea, coffee. You could even bring a steak, to, and they would cook it for you and charge you accordingly. And while he was getting his protein hit, John could also browse through a selection of complimentary books and newspapers, keeping his brain fit and alert to deal with London's roads and grow his business. By the time the cab shelters were built in the 1870s, John's business was thriving. He ended up, cheers love, with nearly 30 people working for him and 126 horses. In fact, when he was 68, he sold up and retired on the profits. Not bad for a cabbie, eh? Cheers, mate. Cheers. Victorian Britain was brimming with inventions, and people experimenting with new ideas. But forget your isambard Kingdom Brunels of this world and all those boats and bridges of his, and consider instead another great Victorian advance. It's the invention of modern shopping. You see, with all that new industry, wages were on the up. 
and for the first time, working people had a bit of money to spend. The canny Victorian shopkeeper was only too pleased to help. By the late 19th century, the competition for customers was really hotting up. A hundred years previously, a window display like this one would have been completely unimaginable. The shops had been small, specialist, and staffed by very fierce shopkeepers. But change was on its way, and it was pioneered by women like Esther Brown. Here she is. Esther was born in 1878 in Manchester where she grew up in a small terraced house. Her dad, Joseph, worked on the trams, while her mum, Margaret, stayed at home looking after Esther and her brother and sister. The Victorians, though, didn't really do childhood, and by the age of 14, Esther had left school and was working on a market stall selling household bits and bobs. But down the market, things were a bit, well, down market. And when Esther was offered a job in a fancy new shop, she jumped at the chance. Esther came up this very road on the first day of her first proper job. The year was 1894, and she was 16. This is Cheetham Hill. It's not the most salubrious part of Manchester, is it? There would have been trams clanging backwards and forwards, lots of new immigrant communities. It would have been noisy, vibrant, energetic, and it was Esther's big day. Her new job was as a shop girl at Michael Marx's Penny Bazaar, which was the very first Marks and Spencer's store. This is the Cheatham Hill M&S now. Well, it was absolutely nothing like that. This was virtually a Victorian pound shop. He kept the stock under tarpaulin in the backyard, and over the front door there was a big scarlet sign that said, don't ask the price, it's a penny. Marx's Penny Bazaar wasn't just a bargain hunter's paradise, though. Oh, that is so lovely. You see, for years, if a customer so much as stepped into a shop, they were expected to buy something. But all that was about to change, with a little help from Esther. Esther's job was to try to persuade her customers to do something entirely new. In fact, it was so new, they had to invent a word for it, and that word was browsing, looking at the goods without feeling that you had a compunction to buy them. Nowadays, we're all brilliant at browsing, aren't we? But back then, it was a novelty. Oh, look, a rolling pin, I can handle it. A basket, I can touch it. Of course, the downside was that from now on, shoplifting became a big problem. I'm sorry, it must have just fallen in my bag. Once the customer had chosen what they wanted, wooden spoon, maybe, a chopping board, four candles, that's actually what these are, then Esther would wrap them all up, but she wasn't allowed to tot up the money. That had to be done by a man. Leanne, can you demonstrate how this procedure works? Certainly. Five pennies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I would then put this in here. This half a ball. This will be closed tight. Now I would put this in the, the slot, send it up through the system. To the cash office? That would go to the cash office. The gentleman would record in the ledger what you'd spent and he would send you change back the exact same way. A nice, sensible man who would know how to add up. Of course. Not like the giddy girls who wouldn't be trusted with that. <laughs> While adding up wasn't high on her list of duties, Esther was expected to be smart, polite, and have the constitution of a... <laughs> exactly. Anyone who's ever worked in retail knows what it's like standing on your feet all day. But Esther's day started at 6 in the morning, finished 10 or 11 at night, so a 90-hour week in big, clumpy shoes, heavy skirt, stiff back, smiling nicely all the time. Must have been so exhausting. And, of course, her customers mm. paid her wages, so they were always, always right. At lunchtime, Esther didn't get much of a break, 
but Michael Marks was better than most employers. At least he installed gas rings like these in the back office so the girls could get some hot food. Such as that shop girl's favourite, a nice bowl of green pea soup. Lovely. For her efforts, Esther was paid a modest £25 a year, around half of what a male shop assistant earned, but just enough for the odd trip to the music hall on her one day off. Working in the shop is so commonplace nowadays that it's easy to underestimate quite how different it would have been for someone like Esther. In those days, a lot of people thought that shop girls were a bit tainted, like prostitutes, you know, just standing out there in public selling stuff to customers. Happily, though, for Esther, things were beginning to look up. Because as shopping got more and more popular, shops began to move into fancy arcades like this. And as for the women who were working in them, they started to have a career path. They could end up as shop managers. And who was one of the first women to do just that? Esther Brown. Before the Victorian age, travel was a bit of a bore. The fastest thing around had four legs and eight straw. So no wonder the invention of the steam train got everyone, including Queen Victoria, rather excited. Albert, I want one. But trains weren't just for the rich and famous. They were used by almost everyone. Like this ordinary shoemaker's son from Manchester, who describes one memorable train journey in his diary. It is very strange reading the diary of someone who was born over 200 years ago and is so candid about their life. His name was Edwin Waugh. He was a secretary writing letters in his office in Manchester in the late 1840s. He'd just turned 30. He lived in Hume with his wife, who looked after the house when he was away working, which is what a Victorian wife would have done in those days. Everything seems hunky-dory, but the diary tells a very different story. Because Edwin was utterly miserable. He and his wife, Mary Ann, weren't exactly love's young dream. Went to Rochdale in the evening in company with my wife. Oh, full of unhappy reflections. Oh. And then there was work. Edwin loathed his job and he hated being two-faced, trying to squeeze money out of people who were in debt to his company. He wrote in his diary, I don't have the beggarly eloquence which can humbug them into a false generosity. For his efforts, Edwin earned about a pound a week, around 130 quid in today's money. But often he wasn't paid at all, prompting him to complain, my wife and me had just one halfpenny between us and we knew not where the next meal was to come from. For the long-suffering Mrs War, it all got too much. After a particularly heated row with his wife, Mary Ann, Edwin describes her packing her bags and heading off for her aunt Sally's in Rochdale. She even takes the rocking chair with her, so she's clearly not intending to come home. Edwin's response is to turn to drink. But Mary Ann must have had second thoughts, because she eventually returned home, presumably with the rocking chair too. To celebrate their reunion, Edwin splashed out on a pair of railway tickets to that home of holiday fun, Blackpool. Mary Ann was going to be so pleased. On the morning of the Blackpool excursion, Edwin gets up early, tries to wake his wife, but she won't budge. He's not going to let her spoil his day, though. So he gets washed, gets all ready, and leaves the house. Oh, Mary Ann. When he got to the station, Edwin was gobsmacked by what he saw. 
I found an astounding gathering of people, upwards of 2,000 persons. You see, to the average Victorian city dweller, the lure of the sea was like human catnip. And beginning in the 1840s, special railway excursions began ferrying hordes of overexcited day trippers to such far flung locations as Brighton, Bangor, and in Edwin's case, Blackpool. Susan? <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you. We're going off on a yes, holiday. It's very exciting. To tell me more about Edwin's big day out is railway historian Susan Major. Why was he so excited about this excursion? Well, he had a particular thing about the thrill of being in a crowd. Now, to us, being in a crowd is a nuisance. Yeah, but, yeah. But somebody like him, he felt it made it feel as if it was one world. It was a new thing. It was a modern thing. Oh, definitely. In Edwin's diary, he does say that there were 2,000 people. I thought that was a misprint. No, the, these were monster trains with monster excursions quite often. You'd find more than one engine pulling up to 100 carriages. Uh, it, there could be three, four engines. It would have been like being on the London Tube in the rush hour in June, <laughs> wouldn't it? People must have felt as though they were being treated as animals. They felt as if they were being dehumanised, so they would bleat and moo and bark. <laughs> Finally, Edwin's train pulled into Blackpool, where he and his fellow passengers disembarked. And like a crowd of starving penguins, headed straight for the sea. So Edwin comes down the high street from the station, and remember, because the crowd know that they've only got a limited amount of time here, they immediately set to work having a good time. The Blackpool of 1849 didn't yet have its famous tower, or even a pier for that matter. Nonetheless, Edwin was totally smitten. The thing he likes more than anything else, though, is the donkeys. There's little kids who get on them and they won't move. He says everybody is having a good time, except presumably the donkeys. And then towards the end of his stay, he buys four chops, raw chops, off some bloke. And then he goes back into town where someone in a shop fries them up for him for fourpence. What a way to spend the day. As for his problems, well, they now seemed a million miles away. But things weren't just looking up for Edwin. In a momentous time marked by new railways, new sewage systems, and even modern shopping, Go. the Victorian period was a crucial part of British history, driven by ordinary women and men across the land. <laughs>